Hello and welcome to Popcorn Mumbles, the podcast where we dig into the back catalog, just like a film or television show to rewatch. I'm your host, Cody Nestor. Alongside me is my co-host, Todd Heal. What's up, everyone? Just a reminder, the video version of today's episode is available on YouTube. If you enjoy the show, please consider following us on your podcast platform of choice and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Todd, it's Bonduary. Oh, man. My favorite month. <laughs> uh, all January and February, we're going to cover uh, as many Bond films as we can, starting with this week's choice. This week, we've chosen the 1962 film, Dr. No. In the film that launched the James Bond saga, Agent 007, Sean Connery, battles mysterious Dr. No, a scientific genius bent on destroying the U.S. space program. As the countdown to disaster begins, Bond must go to Jamaica, where he encounters beautiful Honey Rider, played by Ursula Andress, to confront a megalomaniacal villain in his massive island headquarters. Dr. No was released in the U.S. on May 8, 1963. On a budget of $1 million, it made $16 million worldwide, has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 95% and an audience score of 82%. T- so, Todd, let's discuss Dr. No. Spoilers are ahead. So, Todd, as usual, I'll ask you where you want to start here with Dr. No. Uh, for Dr. No, let's start at the fact that I very rarely got into James Bond movies as a kid. This is something that I didn't get into till I was like a teenager, probably in my early 20s. Uh, anybody remember Spike TV? Is Spike TV still a thing? It's not still a thing, okay. but I remember Spike TV. Spike TV, TBS, they used to show all these, uh, I would say from License to Kill back, they would show these all the time. Right. And they would show them in chunks. They'd have things like called 007 Days of Christmas, mm-hmm. stuff like that. And I watched these all the time as a teenager. And uh, Dr. No being the first one, I always kind of have a special place in my heart, but I I grew to love this series. This is one of those movie series that I've bought on every kind of form of media you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I've bought them a few times myself. I don't own them physically anymore. I have them all digitally through iTunes at this point. Um, but yeah, it's it's a series that I I started to uh, and, and to love and, and grow my fandom in. I think out of your fandom for it. I know you had all the films when I was growing up, and we kind of watched them, and I would borrow them from you and all that kind of stuff. And it's a film series that I absolutely love at this point. We're twenty some odd films deep at this point, and we're still getting some of the best Bond material that we've seen all these years later. Right. Um, I think here, so, you know, obviously the Bond films are based on uh, Ian Fleming's James Bond book series. Right. Um, I never really knew where this stood in that series, but this is the sixth book in Ian Fleming's James Bond series. The first book being what, Todd? Oh, man, you put me on the spot. <clears throat> Casino Royale. Casino Royale, Casino of Royale, baby. And there was also a Casino Royale film, I think, made in the 50s, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. Yeah, it was kind of a played for laughs, kind of a yeah. comedy. Exactly. Um, but, yeah, so you know, going through a little bit of the cast, obviously Sean Connery is James Bond. We'll get into it more as we go. Ursula Andress is Honey Rider. Uh, Bernard Lee is M. Joseph Wiseman plays Dr. No, our, our titular villain. Uh, Jack Lord, Felix oh, yeah. Slider. Yeah, McGarrett. His only, <laughs> his only appearance is Jack Lord, if I'm, I'm as Jack Lord, as himself, as <laughs> Felix Slider, I mean. Right. Uh, and Anthony Dawson plays Professor Dent. And then we have our, our femme fatales, our Bond ladies, or Bond women, whatever you want to, uh, your, whatever your title there that you prefer. Uh, Zena Marshall is Miss Tarot. Uh, we have Eunice Grayson as Sylvia Trench, and of course, uh, later on, we have Lois Maxwell as Miss Money Penny. Nice. Uh, and John Kitts Miller plays Quirrell in this. It plays a little mm-hmm. nice little role. Directed by Terrence Young, I think, directed the first few. I think he did this, Thunderball, and From Rush for Love, if I'm not mistaken. You may be right. I'm not going to say yay or nay because <laughs> of my memory. <laughs> uh, so, Todd, kind of, wh- what's the assignment here? Let's start there. Can you tell us what the assignment for, is for Bond here on his first outing? So basically, we've had a uh, broken communication, a broken transmission from Jamaica. Uh, there's an agent over there by the name of Strangways. Uh, he reports every day around the same time. Uh, his assistant gets everything set up, gets the equipment ready, but she doesn't realize Strangways was killed before he even gets back there. Yeah. W6 in the G7W. W6 in <laughs> G7W. Yeah, they actually show up and kill her as well. Uh, you know, they don't do, do anything to the radio, leave the frequency wide open, they just take a key. Go over to a cabinet and they take out two files and steal them. One says Dr. No, and I believe the other one said Crab Key. Crab Key, right. yeah. So at the start of the film, we get that iconic barrel opening to the James Bond theme that's just, mwah, oh, yeah. Just Chef's Kiss. Uh, 
the uh, the opening credits that we get here for Doctor No, they're simple compared to what they would become. Right. They're still good, but you know, uh, traditionally later on we'd get a lot more, um, you know, a lot more stuff going on in the open credits. A lot more nude women and Naked ladies girls in silhouettes shooting yes, guns. A lot of cars <laughs> flying around. Yeah, that right. kind of stuff. Exactly. But they're they're very simple here, and there's no the 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 Doctor No theme music is that is the James Bond theme right. for the very first film. And, and it fits here. It works, yeah. It absolutely works here. I think I read a little bit um, that the uh, the barrel opening sequence was is not actually Sean Connery, which we'll talk about a little bit later. It's not him until, I think, from Russia with Love, if I'm not mistaken. Or, no, maybe later on after that. I think it was Thunderball. Thunderball, yeah, yeah. I think you're I think you're actually right. But as you said, yeah, that's that's our kind of assignment here, and that's kind of what, what starts off at, at the beginning here is the murder of Strangways, MI six sends out uh James Bond to kind of see what's going on. We get a scene earlier in the film uh where kind of Bond receives his assignment from M back at uh, headquarters. Um we see M kind of chastising Bond for his choice of weaponry. For the Beretta, that yeah, damn Beretta. That damn again. Beretta. Yeah, so he actually, uh, we see here, he's called the Armorer. Yeah, this says this sends in the Armorer. Yeah, not um, not Q. Right, it's not, not Desmond quarter, Llewellyn yeah, yet. Not, yeah. not Q, not Desmond Llewellyn. He'll come into the series later on and be, of course, a mainstay in the James Bond franchise, but... Uh, even before that, I should back up a little bit because I'm I'm overlooking one of the the one of the best things here um, is the the first appearance of Bond oh, at yeah. the like I guess it's the Ambassadors Club. I think that's right. We see him playing playing, playing cards with uh, Sylvia Trench, mm-hmm. uh, and that is there is there a more iconic like the is there a more iconic line delivery of the ver- than the very first Bond James Bond with, with the cigarette? Mm-hmm. It's the most iconic yeah. one, is it not, Mister? Bond. James Bond. It's, I mean, it's just one of those things you just come to, you know, when are they going to work it in right. you know, down the line? But that very first time, it's just it's amazing delivery. It's never been done better. No. Like, it's been done well after, but it's the most iconic of that. Of With just a one, cigarette one, yeah. and just like, ugh. It's just perfect. Chef's kiss stuff. Exactly. And then then we transition from the Ambassador's Club. Uh, he uh, he kind of leaves a little... Uh, you kind of see Bond. We get the ideas of ladies' man. He's got the sex appeal. He's got the Sean Connery vibe going on. Right. Um, he uh, he invite, uh, invites Miss Trench back to his room at some point to meet him on later after he goes and this, receives his assignment from him. Uh, back to the armorer, though. So uh, he does give him his classic Walter PPK, 7.65 mil, of course, mm-hmm. Todd. Um, he has his, his first interaction with Money Penny, and I'm just sitting there just looking at it from a today's environment perspective. I's just like, HR. <laughs> where, where's human resources, please? I'm very uncomfortable. Uh, no touch, please. Like you know, it's just <laughs> different time, folks. It's a very different time. Yeah, and I love that part of the scene before he goes back out and talks to Money Penny, you know, you know, Em's already scolded him about the Beretta. And, you know, he's come in and got fitted for his new weapon, and he, you know, he picks up the box to walk out, and he lifts the Beretta back up to him, mm-hmm. and he's walking out, and M's like, 007, just leave the Beretta. Leave the Beretta. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, kind of let's touch on with the, the weapons and the gadgets of this film. Not not any, not a lot here. Not a lot here. So you get the Walther PPK 7.65 mil. Uh, he has a self-destructor bag, M says, that he's right. outfitted with, which is like his briefcase, I guess, in his bag. Right. Uh, and the only other piece of equipment that I really noted here was the Geiger counter that he sends for. Yeah, he gets a Geiger counter sent out to him in the field, yeah. Um, very, very limited on gadgets, which I actually like. Yeah, I think it works here. It's I a, think less gadgets actually yes. is better. In my mind, in my when I, if I was in charge of making a Bond film, the less gadgets, the better to me. The more espionage, spy stuff, the more basic and limited is, the better. You can do gadgets as long. I mean, that's that's you know, it, it almost becomes a parody of itself. Some later on with some of the Bond films where the gadgets get so over the top, but also get so sus. Specific, right? Like right. avalanche jackets, yeah, and those kind of <clears throat> things, like very instant specific type. Exactly, stuff. exactly. Like so, I like here that it's very, it's very espionage driven. It's very basic. He's not, he's not out. He doesn't have a jetpack, right? Right. You know, no he doesn't any of that kind of stuff. So yeah, very limited gadgets here, which I actually is, I think of is a is a strength of the film. I think more than anything else. Um, so what's going on down in Jamaica, Todd? So uh, basically, uh, Strangways had been uh, taking a boat out with a local uh, fisherman down there by the name of Quarrel, and they've been ex- 
you know, kind of checking out some islands around there. Uh, the big, the big thing in the movie is that Cape Canaveral is having a lot of trouble with their rocket launches. Somebody's been interfering with them, you know, messing them up. And, and these are American rockets. Right, American rockets, and they've kind of got it narrowed down to that particular area. You know, something going on down that way. And uh, Strangways and Quarles been checking out a. Uh, some little islands around in Jamaica, but in particularly Crab Key. Crab Key. And this is where Jack Lord comes in the film, and, and Quarrel we mentioned is for, uh, before Jack Lord is Felix Leiter. We see him first uh, at the airport when Bond first arrives in Jamaica. Right. We also see a, a, a girl who is pretending to be a photographer, try to snap a picture of Bond as he goes by, but he puts his hat up in front of his head yep. and blocks her. I, I really like the uh, the little scene with the driver. And, uh, they He... He says that the uh, the uh, what is the the name of the place? The government house. The government house yes. has sent a uh, <clears throat> car for Bond, and he's going to take him there. Bond's immediately suspicious. He goes back inside, uh, tells the driver he's going to call and check on his like you know his hotel and everything, and calls the government house. We didn't send the car for you. He knows instantly something's going on. Right. And uh, so he takes off with the, uh, the the car driver, and then the car driver starts to say, you know, we're being followed. He has him pull off on you know one of the the side roads there. There, and that's when Bond goes ahead and pulls out the, the Walther on him because he knows something's up. Uh, I like when he's like getting out of the, like Bond's telling him to get out of the car. And he's like, you know, hands where you can see him. He tries to reach for the, the gun in the uh, the glove box, and it's just that judo chop to the hand <laughs> with the other gun. Right. Uh, the cyanide cigarette, really cool. Oh, yeah. Uh, Bond is trying to, like, you know, ask him, like, basically, he works for. He's like, oh, let me let me have a cigarette, man. <laughs> you know, let, let me just get one more puff, please. And uh, he gets a cigarette, like, snaps it off in his mouth, cyanide cigarette. Another little cool espionage, you know, type right. uh, spy kind of stuff there. All, all really good stuff. Um, I really like, so Bond goes back to the hotel. He checks in. I really like the hotel scene because you get that, again, that espionage stuff. He he knows that potentially there that people know he's there. Obviously, like he's been met at the airport by someone trying to kill him already. Right. So he goes in and starts um, uh, doing things in the room so he knows if anybody's tampered with his stuff. So he takes his briefcase, he puts like talcum powder on the locks to see if anybody touches it to mess with his briefcase, and he takes and plucks a hair from the back of his head, and he kind of like. Uh, takes some spit and like sticks it to the closet door to see if anybody's like rambling through his shit. Yeah. That little stuff, you don't get that later on in some of the Bond films. It gets a little fantastical and like bigger. It's a nice touch. Yeah, just to see the little espionage stuff, like the little like spy stuff. And like you have to be careful and like those kind of things. Like, you know, just to see him kind of play the situation. You get a lot of that really good stuff here in the these these this early Bond films, right. I would say. And this one in particular. Um Let's uh, let's introduce one of our other characters here. Let's uh, tell us about the professor, Professor Dent. Yes, yes. Uh, Strangways had apparently uh, took some samples from Crab Key, and he had took them to Professor Dent to be analyzed. Uh, Dent, of course, told him it was just you know just you know basic shit, nothing nothing wrong with him. But that stuff we find out later was radioactive. Active, and uh, it, it's coming from Crab Key. Those are the those are the samples. And right away, Bond kind of knows that something's up with the old professor there. Right. Um, the professor, after he's kind of, uh, kind of confronted a little bit by Bond at his office, he decides to, uh, break the rules and head for Crab Key right. to speak to Hutan. To Dr. No. The titular Dr. No. Uh, the little scene with him in the, uh, Dr. No's little room there, it's pretty great. Like, I like, you don't see Dr. No. Dr. Mm -hmm. No's not really in this film much until, like, the very the end. The very end, Like, yeah. the last 20, 30 minutes, maybe. Right. Might even be 20 minutes. But he has uh, the professor. He tells him, you know, obviously, you know, basically it's the, the villain cliche, you know, don't fail me again type stuff. Right, you know, right. I'll blame you if, if you don't kill Bond type stuff. What does he give him to take Bond out? He gives him a tarantula and a, like a little wooden cage. Yes, yes. So we see that night uh, Bond returns back to his hotel room. He obviously knows someone was in his room. There's no hair on the door, the talcum powder, like there's fingerprints on the briefcase. Um even the bottle of uh, whatever he's, his liquor of choice. Vodka, yeah. Yeah, he, he switches the bottle out just in case someone may have done something to it. And then old Jimmy Bond wakes up a little bit later with uh, – he's, he's used to – sometimes he – most of the time he's used to certain people in his bed, but he wasn't used to what he finds in his bed later. Not no eight-legged creature crawling yeah. up his side. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, we see the, the tarantula – uh, on his, uh, on his, like kind of on his shoulder, on his back, it eventually crawls its way off of him without, uh, without actually doing anything to him, and he just smashes that bastard with a shoe. I thought it was cool too in that scene where he's beating it to shit with. 
beating it to death with that shoe, it kind of matches up the beats to the music. Usually like, like bam, boom, bam, boom, bam, boom, bam, bam, bam. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's great. Uh, from there, um, he uh, he's kind of talking with uh, the kind of the guy that's that's you know, kind of the head of the government house at one point, and he kind of discovers a, 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 a eavesdropping secretary. Yes, uh, that is Miss Tarot. Right. Uh, she uh, he ends up kind of speaking with her and uh, kind of making plans to to meet with her at some point. Uh, she ends up calling him up, and he's obviously immediately suspicious. She ought, she she calls him up though and invites him to come up to her place on Magenta Drive. <laughs> and that's where we get uh, a hearse chase. Right, right. So we see a hearse at the beginning of the movie where Strangways is actually killed. The uh, the three guys and the driver that actually killed Strangways, they take off in a, in a hearse. Mm -hmm. And I, when I was watching it again, I was like, is that a hearse? <laughs> I was like, I couldn't remember. I was like, oh, that's a hearse. And we get our we get our hearse chase here. And we see the car that Bond is driving in this film. So it's not uh, it's not the Aston Martin. It's just, I'm assuming it's maybe a rental. It's like a little blue convertible. It's a Sunbeam Alpine. Okay. Uh, that is the car for this film as well. Uh, but he heads off to uh, to Miss Tarot's house. Um, and uh, I love, this is my, the the Tarot's house has my favorite scene in the whole film. Okay. So, um, you know, obviously he's he's with Tarot. He's, he's already suspicious of her. She's kind of surprised he's there. Like, oh, you know, she was figuring he's going to be took out by the hearse. Exactly. The there. hearse ends up, he ends up getting away from them and they uh, crash and burn and go off the hill and we get a good bond little quip. One of the road workers is like, what happened to them? And he's like, they were on their way to a funeral. <laughs> you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Like, right. so little, little great little bond, little, little quip there. Um, but uh, he goes and he, he's with Miss Tarot and like, he, uh, She's like I said, surprised to see him, and then he he does like a little subtle thing. She's like kind of coming out of the shower. She's got like some, I don't know if it's a towel on or something else, and then but she has a towel on her neck definitely. And he like kisses her, and he takes the towel off of her neck, and he kind of very subtly see it, but he like wipes his lips off, kind of like almost in disgust in a way a little bit, right? Right. Because you know this bitch ain't right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he he's got and but he's Jimmy Bond, so he's like I'll pipe her down to the good guys get here. <laughs> You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. He, he's Jimmy Bond. I keep you occupied. Exactly. So he, he pipes her down until he gets the uh, the government house guys to show up and pretty much take her off and bust her because he knows that she's part of, like, setting him up and trying to get him killed. And he knows that she she takes a phone call, and he knows someone is coming there at some point to try to, to, try to kill him. Off, yeah. And that gives me the my favorite scene in the whole film, which is the scene between him and Professor Dean. Oh, yeah. So he is, like, set up. I like how, again, he arranges her little apartment or her little house. House. Like he puts two drinks out on the table. He smushes down the pillow, puts his jacket there. He dishevels the bed, puts a little fake, uh, you know, pillowcase body kind of thing there right. to make him yeah. think he's in the bed. And he takes his seat behind the door where the door will open to where he can't be seen. And then prof for uh, Professor Dent sneaks in, fires off six shots into uh, the fake Bond laying in the bed. And then we get a uh, little conversation back and forth. He tells him to drop his gun. He drops it on like kind of like a blanket or like uh, the uh, the comforter or something nearby. Right. And he's trying to slowly grab that back. And he finally does grab it. And Bond, it's like the best line in the film, was like, that's a Smith & Wesson, and you've had your six. And then, <laughs> it's a Smith & Wesson, and you've had your six. Oh, it's just it's, and it's, it's good stuff. Man. It's like so it's so cold blooded. It's like so dispassionate. Like there's it's just he kills him so dispassionately. Mm -hmm. Like that line delivery is just perfect. And it's like just it's just like a it's like nothing to him to kill this guy. And he shoots him in the front. And I love how he falls down on the ground and he like shoots him in the back too. Right. Like just just oh. another day at the office. Exactly. Like that's what's <laughs> so like you see it a lot later with like the Craig stuff where he's just like He's just like kind of, and you see it some with the Brosnan stuff where he's like, there's those kind of really cold blooded moments that come out for Bond where he just murders someone completely dispassionately. Right. Here's our first example of that on, on film. Um, let's see, where do you want to go here, Todd? What else we need to cover on here? So, uh, after that little episode, he has to make it back to the docks because he's supposed to leave with Quarrel to go over. They're going to check out Crab Key. Exactly. Uh, this is where we they do make it to Crab Key, and this is where the next morning, 
on Crab Key. After they hide the boat and everything, we get introduced to uh, Honey Rider. Honey Rider. Played by Ursula Andrus. So, here, Todd, I'll ask you this. So, you know, in addition to, you know, the car and the suit, uh, we should also mention the watch that Mon wears in this is a Rolex Submariner. Ah. So, in the early films, uh, a Bond was a Rolex man. Gotcha. Uh, we already mentioned the car, the weapons, and the gadgets, but we got to mention the birds, Todd. <laughs> Those Bond birds. So the Bond ladies, the Bond girls. So in this, we talked about we have Sylvia Trench, uh, Eunice uh, Gason, uh, Zena Marshall, Miss Taro, and then we have Ursula Andrews as Honey Rider. What's your What's your personal preference here, Todd, of our three? Oh, me. I would probably have to go with Honey Rider. <laughs> it's hard not to. It's I hard mean, not to. Is there more is there a more iconic Bond girl introduction than Honey Rider? I don't think so. I mean, it's amazing. We get the, the most iconic. You know, Bond, James Bond delivery. We also probably get the most iconic Bond girl. I think if you ask someone to, like, name a Bond girl, maybe they don't say Ursula Andrews. Maybe they don't know her by name, but they know that shot. Oh, yeah. Uh, any any person that knows Bond knows her coming out of the water. Obviously, it was parodied in Casino Royale with Daniel Craig doing the same thing. And actually tried to replicate it with Halle Berry, if you remember, in Die Another Day. <laughs> I tried to forget that, <laughs> but you're right. right. They do try to do that, uh, not successfully. Yeah, I mean, Honey Rider, just classic, classic Bond uh Bond lady, um, Miss Tara though, I, I really She's pretty nice, really like Miss Tara. Even Sylvia Trench, I, I even, mean, yeah, you can't go wrong either way here. I mean, that's uh, that's why uh, that's why he's Jimmy Bond. He that's makes right. He makes good choices. Um, but yeah, so they're on Crab Key, and uh, what's on Crab Key? What, what, what's the local narrative? Of what lives on Crab Key? So kind of earlier, we learned from Quarrel that he's kind of a, a lot of people are afraid to go over there because they have heard as a dragon over there, a fire breathing dragon. Right, right. And she's uh, Honey's there, kind of co- collecting shells. Like they used to kind of chase her away, you know, from Doctor Nose Island, but you know they couldn't catch her, so they pretty much give up. Uh, they're kind of Bond and Quarrel and her kind of take fire from like a boat out in the water, but they're uh, they manage to like you know kind of survive that they're kind of pursued by some of Dr. No's kind of uh, military kind of agents with dogs and stuff like that. They go through the rivers and stuff and they have a scene where they like cut some reeds off and breathing like breathing underwater with breathe, the reeds. Exactly, breathing <laughs> underwater. Uh, one of the one of the guards or the military soldiers kind of does hang back and Bond ends up having to take him out with Honey's knife. Uh, but eventually they are set upon by the uh, quote unquote dragon, which is like a big diesel powered machine of I don't know, murder? <laughs> like, I don't know what you call it. It is kind of made up with teeth in the front, like it's painted. And right. It's got a flamethrower out the front. And uh, we, we lose see Quarrel. <laughs> yeah, we see Bond and Quarrel kind of, you know, kind of shooting at it. And uh, Quarrel gets uh, fricasseed. He gets, uh, he <laughs> gets too close. He gets roasted extra crispy. Uh, and uh, Bond and Honey are captured, and we uh, we get uh, Bond and Honey back at Doctor Nose bitching under underwater layer. Yeah, uh, something I have a note about it too. But uh, you kind of seeing them walk around the the layer, and you know, there's kind of the kind of guest services for the layer, I guess you would say. Oh yeah, kind of checking them in and like you know showing them to their room and, and everything, and. Uh, we get they go to their room they get they decontaminate them first they decontamination they're, yeah yeah they're like you know kind of registering on the Geiger counter so they kind of run them through the the uh, the, the the radioactive kind of con- decontamination wash kind of parried it a little bit in the Austin Powers movie yeah, yeah. when he first wakes up right uh, but they run them through that they give them some you know uh, they give them some clothes send them to their room and then uh, they start drinking coffee. <laughs> we were talking about this before. Right. Uh, they start drinking coffee because they're set to have dinner with Dr. No that night. And they're drinking. Honey's drinking her coffee, and she starts to, like, pass out. And Bond's like, what, what's wrong? And he's like, damn coffee. <laughs> <And like laughs> throws it across the room. Uh, but then we get um, uh, the dinner with Dr. No, basically. And uh, we get to see – I love the the aquarium He's got, and it's like the big magnified fish. Making him look 10 times, 100 times bigger. I have, a really note of, I have a note about it, but I'm like, look at those damn fish. It reminded me of that scene from uh, Bad Boys 2 where oh, Marcus yeah. is like on those pews. And he's like, there's a nice fucking fish. <laughs> it got big eyes, but it's a nice fucking fish. This is a nice fish, you know? Big fucking eyes, but a nice fucking fish. 
<laughs> that's what it reminded me of. And then, uh, but you get uh, kind of the, the first introduction to uh, the Dr. No at, at the dinner scene. Uh, and the whole time in the dinner, my second favorite scene in the film is the, the dinner with Dr. No because Bond is just trying to antagonize him like the whole time. Just getting under his skin the whole dinner. Exactly. Like, you know, trying to you know, kind of bluff him out that, you know, they, they figured out what he's doing and he's like sent a report. And then there's a line where uh, he's like, tell me, does the toppling of American missiles really compensate for having no hands? Because <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. No, I guess in some type of accident. Lost both hands. Yeah, And he has these kind of, I guess, mechanical almost prosthetics that give him uh, kind of really kind of almost superhuman strength in his hands. Crushes some little statue and throws it down. Exactly. Uh, Dr. No's backstory, he's kind of, I think he says he's uh, of half Asian descent and half something else. German. I German, I think, yes. And he um, he kind of was with the, what was it, the, do you remember the name of the? What's it, the Tongs? The Tongs, and he kind of, uh, the, the gang in China or the organization in China, he stole 10 million pounds of gold, you know, and gold from them and kind of come and, and kind of start pretty much enacting his plans at some point. Basically, um, I think pretty much it's, uh, he he's, his his motivation here is that he was kind of uh, shunned by the Americans and the Russians, uh, and he's kind of this is his way of kind of enacting revenge for that. Pretty yeah. much is like to fuck with these rockets. Pretty much, I guess, right, and the, right. the American kind of missile program and and uh, you know kind of the stuff that the Americans were doing at the time is pretty much the motivation. I think in a nutshell for Doctor No's character, um, we get our first mention of Spectre. Yes. Do you remember uh, what the acronym for Spectre I actually stands? wrote it down. Look at me, believe it there or not. There you go. What do we got here, uh, Todd? Special Executive for Counterintelligence, Terrorism, Revenge, and Extortion. Yes. And Bond has another quip because he thinks potentially Bond, could, he looks at Bond as maybe someone that could join Spectre, and Bond makes a quip. is like, I prefer the revenge department. <laughs> right, You know, right. kind of thing. But, yeah, again, like Dr. No's motivation, he's trying to get revenge on America and Russia for rejecting him basically by creating World War Three, pretty much. Much. Um, kind of take us through the ending a little bit here, Ton. Uh, after the dinner with Doctor No, how do we kind of wrap things up? So they kind of while they're at dinner, they kind of decide that you know, hey, Bond kind of wants Honey Rider out of the situation. He kind of knows she's just an innocent caught up in all this, and Doctor No kind of agrees, but he kind of says this line like, you know, let the guards go have their way with her, and you know, Bond kind of steps up, and wants to get in a fight with them, but. Uh, Honey gets escorted out, and Dr. No's head is full of, full of James Bond, so he starts having his cronies beat the crap out of him. <laughs> right. Uh, Bond kind of gets away, goes up into kind of the, the uh, tunnel system, uh, kind of works his way down into Dr. No's command center. Uh, he kind of catches a guy kind of coming out of there to uh, – Right there near the decontamination bath, he kind of gets a drop on him, steals his get up, goes in. Yeah, puts on his radiation suit. Radiation yeah. suit. Uh, he's kind of in there looking around, trying to get the lay of the place, and he kind of sees the master controls for the radiation. <laughs> he just wreaks habit by turning a big wheel. He just turns that big wheel wide open to max, <laughs> and the whole place just starts blowing. Exactly. <laughs> Everything goes to hell, and pretty much that's uh, everybody. I mean, Dr. No and all his cronies pretty much end up Getting uh, getting murked in the 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 fallout of a bond kind of wreaking havoc with everything right. in the systems as they're trying to fuck with that American missile launch basically. Uh, bond and Honey escape. Yep. Uh, we see Felix kind of come to the rescue as Bond and Honey are kind of floating at sea adrift. Uh, Felix kind of you know begins like you know hit there in a boat and they're trying to like tow him back to shore, but we see Bond kind of untie the rope. That's yeah, him it. and the honeys have another little uh, round, we'll yeah. say. And... Underneath the mango tree, <laughs> you know, having another little sweet uh, little love making session. And they're just, uh, we end the film, they're just uh, both adrift at sea. Uh, they both die at sea, I uh -huh. assume. What? No. And that was the end of the James Bond film franchise. As our main character floated and died at sea. One and done, folks. From uh, dehydration. One and done. <laughs> Uh, so Todd, I've got some, uh, some, I'm going to call them double O no's. Oh, wow. these are some, uh -oh. these are some goofs from the film. Just okay. a few. There was actually quite a few that I went through, but just some I thought were interesting. Okay. Uh, did you notice this one? I'm pretty sure you did. There's a part where James and honey are washing themselves by the waterfall after Bond killed the guard and their clothes are like they're wet in one scene and they're completely dry when they, oh, when they come yeah. from the water. Right. Um, Annabelle, she's that, uh, photographer. 
Yeah, I got you. Uh, there's yeah. a scene earlier we didn't mention where she tries to take Bond's picture again at like a little like nightclub kind of thing, like Havana kind of club. Pussfeller's place. Pussfeller's place. <laughs> yes, yes. I hope his cooking is better than he fights, Todd. <laughs> um, but uh, Quarles kind of grabs her and like twists her arm or whatever, and she uh, she cracks a flash bulb and like gouges his right cheek, oh, yeah. and you see like a lot of blood on his hand. Uh, in subsequent shots, there is no wound on his face in uh, in the subsequent shots after that little interaction. Uh, while he's waiting in the dark in Miss Tarot's house, Bond's socks change from long to short, and his ties dis- and his tie disappears by the time he's attached the silencer. Oh. <laughs> uh, during Bond's shootout with the dragon on the beach, he uses three different model handguns. He uses his Walter PPK. It changes to a Colt 1911 government model, then to a Browning uh, High Power, and then back to a Walter PPK. Look at Jimmy, that personal arsenal right there. <laughs> He's just like swapping them out. <laughs> this one ain't working. This one. This one might work. His gun also goes into uh, slide lock, so indicating that it's empty twice while shooting and visibly, uh, without visibly reloading, uh, continues to fire. Jimmy's got the magic bullets. Magic He's bullets, shooting. baby. Uh, I got some bond bits for you. You got anything, Todd? I don't want to. I don't want to step on you here. I got a couple things, but uh, you know, you go ahead and if you knock one off my list, I'll start with one I got. So uh, <laughs> some bond bits I've got. There's obviously a lot here uh, that I could choose from. So this was chosen to be the inaugural movie in the Bond film franchise, as the plot of the source novel was the most straightforward. It had only one major location being Jamaica, and only one big special effects set piece. That was one I had, so I'll, I'll <laughs> drop down to go to my next one, which was uh, Sean Connery was afraid of spiders. I had that one as well. <laughs> which led to the initial filming of that scene with the tarantula with a sheet of glass between the actor and the spider, and when they thought that wasn't quite convincing enough, they used uh, the stuntman Bob Simmons to kind of you know get close-ups of that spider crawling on him. Yes. And uh, Simmons was later uh, recorded as saying that that spider crawling over Bond was one of the scariest stunts he ever performed. And the tarantula was named Rosie. Rosie. <laughs> Absolutely. I had that one as well. Um, contrary to popular belief, I it was something I was trying to look for, honestly, because I know just from, uh, you know, kind of behind the scenes, you know, osmosis information that you absorb over the years, that in some of the Bond films that Connery wore a hairpiece. Oh, and yeah. I was kind of looking for it in this one. I'm like, did he have a hairpiece? But contrary to popular belief, Sir Sean Connery was not wearing a hairpiece in his first two outings as James Bond. Although he was already balding by the time Dr. No was in production, he still had a decent amount of hair, and the filmmakers used varying techniques to make the most of what was left. By the time of Goldfinger in 1964, Connery's hair was too thin, and so various toupees were used for his last Bond outings. Uh, we, f- we know your pain, Sean. <laughs> yeah, as a bald us. man ourselves, we we understand. Uh, the last one I had was uh, Maurice Binder uh, designed the gun barrel sequence at the last minute using a pinhole camera and pointing it through an actual real gun barrel. Yep. And believe it or not, that was not Sean Connery. That was stuntman Bob Simmons who performed that first famous gun barrel walk. And in fact, that sequence was reused uh, for From Russia with Love and Goldfinger. Yes. Connery didn't perform the walk himself until Thunderball. Nice. Uh, as detailed uh, as Dr. No's underwater layer was, one vital element was very nearly forgotten. Background plates of fish swimming in the sea to be added to the thick glass window. The necessary film was quickly found among library footage the day before the scene was to be filmed. When it turned out the footage featured extreme close-ups of fish, it was decided to have Dr. No explain that the window works as a magnifying glass, ah. which he does say in the film, he which does, I thought was does. funny. That's a nice looking fish. <laughs> <laughs> Your fish are huge. Uh, according to Lois Maxwell, Ursula Andress made quite an impression at the rap party. At the party, she danced with all the crew, and she was the first grown woman I'd ever known who didn't wear a bra. As she danced, those wonderful breasts were just swaying. I remember thinking how marvelous it must be to be that uninhibited, and I wanted to throw my bra off, but I didn't have the courage. Good God Almighty, why? Why <laughs> didn't you do it? To have been at that party, boy. Yeah. Uh, a Francisco de Goya painting of the Duke of Wellington stolen in August, uh, stolen in August 1961 from London's National Gallery is found on the easel next to the stairs in Dr. No's dining area, which is why Bond stops to notice it as he passes it while going up the stairs. It was recovered in 1965. When this movie first came out, British audiences laughed upon seeing the Goya, noting it had been stolen. 
According to director Terrence Young, the idea for the stolen painting prop came from the film's Irish co-screenwriter, Johanna Harwood. A clip of this scene is featured in The Duke, uh, which was released in 2020, which dramatized the theft. Ah. I was wondering what that painting was. I remember seeing it, and I was like, that's got to have some kind of significance somehow. A few more here. So Sir Sean Connery won the role of James Bond after producer Albert R. Broccoli. You can call him Cubby, Todd. I'll call him Cubby. Uh, Attended a screening (laughs) of Darby O'Gill and the Little People. He was particularly impressed with the first uh, fight Connery had with Village Bully at the climax of the movie. Broccoli later had his wife, Dana Broccoli, see the movie and confirm his sex appeal. Still, for publicity purposes, there was a contest to find the perfect man to play James Bond. Six finalists were chosen and screen tested by Albert R. Broccoli, Harry Saltzman, and Ian Fleming. The winner was a 28-year-old mo- eight-year-old model named Peter Anthony who looked the part but completely lacked the acting technique to play it. Ah. Ian Fleming... Uh, bleh. Ian Fleming didn't originally like the casting of Sean Connery as James Bond, as Bond was English, whereas Connery uh, was Scottish. Bond was from an upper-class background, while Connery came from working-class background. And where Bond was refined and educated, he felt Connery was too rugged. After seeing the movie, however, Fleming softened, decided that Connery was perfectly cast. In the novel on Her Majesty's Secret Service, Bond was revealed to have Scottish ancestry, and Bond's girlfriend, Teresa Tracy Vincenzo, R.I.P., uh, was described with <laughs> Ursula Andress's details. Ironically, Fleming, uh, Fleming initially thought the younger Roger Moore, who eventually took over the R- James Bond role from Connery, would be ideal in all respects, but Moore wasn't available at the time. Uh-huh. And last one I have here, Todd, is a longstanding misconception that John Barry wrote the James Bond theme. It actually originated from a song, Good Sign, Bad Sign, composed by Monty Norman from an aborted musical, The House of Miss Biswa, Mr. Biswa. Barry arranged and orchestrated Norman's theme to produce the theme as it is known throughout the world. So nice. just a little bit of nugget I thought that I would find here. So, Todd, are you ready to move on for our two-hour review scores? I'm ready if you are. All right, so we rank films on a scale of 1 to 10. Starting from 1, the ranks are Torture, 2, Awful, 3, Bad, 4, Sapar, 5, Mediocre, 6, Decent, 7, Good, 8, Great, 9, Amazing, 10, Masterpiece. So, Todd, give us any final thoughts you'd like and your review score for Dr. No. Uh, this is, in my opinion, a very – Solid first outing for Agent 007. Uh, Sean Connery takes this role and just runs with it right from the start. Uh, We're on the ground floor, folks, here of one of the longest, most successful film franchises of all time that in just three years' time, by 1965, will be a global phenomenon. I give Dr. No eight little cage tarantulas, which (laughs) on our scale is great. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it it starts off... It's amazing how solidly it starts off and, you know, it would definitely evolve and you would kind of see some of the other things that become kind of popularized within the series kind of creep up. But like, it's just amazing to look back on it and see how much it set up right at the beginning that kind of stayed true. And the best thing that come out of the film was the casting of Sean Connery. I think many people probably still arguably have him as their high, you know, their best James Bond. I'll go on record right now. He's my personal right. favorite. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think, you know, a lot of people obviously love, you know, the Brosnan. There's some, I'm, I was never a Moore guy right. as much. Um, I love Brosnan. I obviously love Craig, but I mean, I, you know, I can't, if I had to do a list today, it would be hard pressed to really not put Connery on it. It just, from everything, from the look, you know, the ruggedness I think does look, I mean, obviously the guy had the sex appeal, you know, I mean, I mean, it, it just it all worked. Everything about the, the the first film worked, and I think it was a smart choice to do Doctor No over something like Casino Royale, you know, something like that. I think it had a little bit more, uh, kind of a little bit bigger story to it, a little bit bigger stake. So, like, I think it was a great way to kick off the series. Uh, I can't wait to do some more of these films throughout the rest of Bonduary here that we got going. Time yeah. for me, I give Doctor No an eight out of ten, which ranks it as great. So, Todd, can you tell everyone how they can find us and stay up to date with us on social media? We're at Tao Capes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Tao Capes Podcast on Facebook. You can also email us at TaoCapesPod at gmail.com. Also, if you're so obliged, leave us a five-star review on your podcast app of choice. really helps the show. Popcorn Mumbles will return next week. We want to thank you so much for listening. Until next time, bye, guys. See you, guys.